Now, given the history of, uh, you know, the, the last 50, 60 years, one always asks, well, were these schools racially integrated or not? Um, and the answer is generally no. They were generally segregated, not by law, but in de facto, in practice. The laws of these southern states did not require racial segregation. Some of them banned them, particularly South Carolina and Louisiana constitutions prohibited racial segregation, although it de facto developed um, anyway. Um, local whites were particularly hostile to integrated public education. Um, white, white families refused to send their children to integrated public schools by and large, and most black families seem to have felt that the priority was education, not whether or not, not who was sitting next to you in the classroom. Remember, the alternative here for African Americans was not simply integration versus segregation. There was a third possibility, which was exclusion altogether, right? That's what they had suffered up to this point, no education. So in the step into segregated education was a major step forward rather than something that they... Now, now there were a few black leaders, particularly in those two places where the free black community was so prominent, South Carolina and Louisiana, where there was a big push to integrate the public schools. Francis Cardozo, the superintendent of education of South Carolina said that this was the only way to really eliminate racial prejudice, to do it from the bottom up, to do it from children getting to know each other early on, and that would eventually purge the South of racial, pre and it would also be living proof of this principle, or, or living illustration of this principle of equality uh, before the law. But actually, even in South Carolina, the local school boards basically set up separate schools um, because they just felt they couldn't function otherwise. Only in Louisiana was there any extensive racial integration of the public schools. And in fact, in the Janap book, you have the uh, editorial in the New Orleans Tribune, black newspaper, black-owned newspaper, about integrated education. The editorial there says, we, we have to make this community one nation and one people. That's a good summary of what a lot of these people are. Make this one nation and one people, and the way to do that is to put people, one of the ways to do that is put people together, children together, in public school. And so Louisiana, actually, the legislature passed a law prohibiting the exclusion of children from public schools on the basis of race. In fact, fining any teacher or school official who excluded a child from school on the basis of their race. Um, and when Republicans took power in New Orleans in 1870, they established a, the, real, the only real example of a functioning integra racially integrated school system in Reconstruction was in New Orleans where they just mandated, from now on, all schools can be integrated. At first, a lot of the white students withdrew, but then they came back, and by 1877, when Reconstruction ends there, uh, there are several thousand white and black children attending integrated public schools in New Orleans. One of the very, very first things, as we'll see, that the so-called redeemers, the Democrats who came back into power in 1877, one of the first things they did was to repeal the integrated education law and to mandate racial separation uh, in the schools. Most of the universities were segregated. In other words, these black universities were set up partly to avoid conflict over integrating the existing university. So instead of, let's say, University of Mississippi being integrated, you had Alcorn set up for black uh, these are very small institutions at that time. Uh, you know, they're not like today with tens of thousands of students. Very small. But uh, so you set up Alcorn or Fisk, as I said, up in Tennessee. Um, in, the, in Arkansas, at the University of Arkansas, there was only one black student 
at the university level during Reconstruction, and he was taught by the president of the university in his own home. And that rather than him going to classes with other students, the president sort of tutored him so he wouldn't have to be in there with the white students. Again, the one counterexample is South Carolina, where the University of South Carolina, the legislature mandated that the University of South Carolina had to admit black students. The university which had existed before the Civil War, in fact, it had been the training ground of, um, of secessionism. They had taught secession in the University of South Carolina. And as I've mentioned weeks ago, many of the leaders of secession in other states were South Carolinians who had been educated at the pre-war University of South Carolina and then migrated out to other southern states. So this is the period that they call in South Carolina the radical university. 1871 to 77, racially integrated. Many of the students, and again, you're talking about a pretty small number, were actually black members of the legislature who wanted to get further, because this is Columbia, South Carolina, where the legislature is and the university is, and they wanted to get more education. Now, some, se several of the professors resigned from the University of South Carolina rather than teach black students. One of them, this is a name which might conjure up something if you're from California, one of them, a very distinguished scientist named LeConte decided he had to get as far away from black students as he possibly could. The furthest he could get was Berkeley, California. So he went to Berkeley, he got a job there, became a major founder of some branch of American science, and at the University of California, Berkeley, there is LeConte Hall today, named after him. Nobody says why he was there in the first place, because he refused to teach black students in South Carolina. So this question of school integration is actually one piece of the whole question of, I guess what you call civil rights, or to use this phrase which the free black leaders of Louisiana introduced into the language of rights, public rights, public rights, not civil rights, not social rights, not political rights, not natural rights, public rights how you are treated by public facilities, public institutions. Um, and this was also a main area of interest of these um, Reconstruction governments. The black leadership was highly interested in this question of treatment in public, which was closely related to this question of racial segregation or integration um, or exclusion. As we'll see next time, the United States Congress in 1875 enacted the last Reconstruction measure, the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which prohibited segregation or discrimination on the basis of race in public facilities. It didn't apply to a schools, but businesses, public accommodations, railroads, transportation, etc was prohibited. It was the last major piece of Reconstruction legislation. It was later declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in 1883. Um, but there were also a lot of state laws. That was a federal law. But there were many state laws in Reconstruction demanding equality before the law, requiring act for South Carolina, for example, made a business, a public business that discriminated on the basis of race liable to a thousand dollar fine or the proprietor possibly a jail term. Um, the Louisiana Bill of Rights of 1868 talked about this concept of public rights. They insisted on equal rights in all licensed businesses and transportation. If you open yourself to the public, if you're a business, you open to the public, you've got to serve everybody. You can't make these discriminations. Um, and with criminal penalties if uh, you violate that. Uh, there were also fights, I wrote about this, on, about streetcars. It, it varied in, from city to city. Most, we're talking about horse-drawn carriages, really, uh, or streetcars, usually one car driven by our horses, which would traverse the streets. Before the Civil War, most of those did not allow blacks at all. Sometimes there were separate cars with a little star. There's a reference to this in the New Orleans thing. 
a star car. That is to say, every once in a while, a car would come by for blacks, and it had a little star on the front showing that this was the black one. The others, they couldn't go on. Or sometimes whites could sit inside in the seats, and then there were these outer railings, and blacks could kind of stand on the outside. But in 1867-68, there were the, this is a hundred years almost before the sit-ins, but there were sit-ins on these horse-drawn coaches in southern cities where African Americans would just seize the seats and refuse to move until transported uh, by the uh, driver. Um, and it, the, the, this happened in Louisville, it happened in Charleston, other cities, uh, and it led the military commanders, this is before the Reconstruction Act, to order these streetcar companies to allow anyone on the streetcar to avoid conflict, really. Um, so my point here is, as I, as I said last time, there is a kind of trope in the literature that only the upper crust blacks cared about these issues of equal treatment in public. After all, you know, not, your average field tan is not going into a hotel anyway, but this is not really entirely true. In these streetcar demonstrations, it was not your upper crust who were, who were sitting in and demanding to be served. It was just everybody who felt it was an indignity to not be able to ride on a public accommodation.